Hi, everyone. Welcome to Interchange. I'm Dan Jones. Thank you so very much for joining us. Lots to talk about today. The years-long effort by the Menominee Indian tribe to build a casino in Kenosha came to an end today when the proposal was rejected by Governor Walker. We'll also talk about Walker's plan to try and stop drug users from getting public benefits like food stamps and unemployment. And we will talk about the streetcar controversy in Milwaukee, which appears to be coming to a head. All right, let me introduce my guest tonight. You know longtime newspaper columnist Joel McNally. And also we have Gerard Randall, education consultant and job creation expert. Rick Horowitz is going to be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, the first thing we'll talk about is the rejection of the Kenosha Casino by Governor Walker. He said former Governor Jim Doyle signed so many agreements with the Potawatomi tribe, which runs the casino here in Milwaukee, which would force the state to make up any losses the Potawatomi suffered if a new casino opened up in Kenosha. He said taxpayers would have potentially been on the hook for hundreds of millions of dollars if a new casino, casino was successful. My first question would be, why in the world, if this was the reason, would it take so long to figure that out? Couldn't you, couldn't you look at those compacts and an hour later know what was required? Yes, and <laughs> then you'd also, given the amount of pressure that was being placed on him by even uh, the conservative wing of the party, uh, the Republican Party, uh, that wanted to see that casino built. Um, he, so he had to try to figure out how can he get the casino done, and it would have been an economic boon to Kenosha and to the, the region uh, in that area, and it also would have cost the Potawatomi a considerable amount of money. Some would say it might have eaten into 50 percent of their net. Um, that, I think, were the motivators behind wanting to get it done, uh, the economic benefit, as well as the opportunity to bring more of the, um, uh, the tourism dollars from northern Illinois into Milwaukee or into uh, Wisconsin. The, the downside for him uh, was, one, I don't believe he really liked the notion of expanded gaming in Wisconsin. Two, I think that there are uh, considerations that had to be made regarding who was going to be responsible for the ultimate payment uh, to the Potawatomi should those gaming compacts be upheld. And three, I, I, he's got an immediate budget crunch that needed to be solved. That $100 million that was sitting out there that the Potawatomi uh, were refusing to make, uh, that had a big impact on the immediate budget. So I think all those things were what was going through his administration's mind uh, when they were considering whether or not they would challenge those compacts and try to move forward with them. Joel, when, when this was laid in his <laughs> lap, he did say at the beginning, I am only going to approve this if I can get all the tribes to agree. And you, you had to think, well, why would the Potawatomi ever agree? <laughs> he said a couple. He said he said many weird things. I, I'm sorry, Gerard. This is this is going to be an, an intimate <laughs> camp, you know, conversation tonight. I, I, you didn't mention politics once. Uh, you didn't mention once that what was it? It was in October uh, 2013. He said that he needed a few more weeks to examine, you know, the 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 deal. Um, well, uh, a few more weeks turned into the, the entire year of 2014 uh, when he was running for re-election. Uh, and I said at the time, I in fact wrote a column back in 2013 saying, this is a money gusher uh, for the governor. Uh, the, the Potawatomi are going to throw all the money at him they can, and, and the Menominees are going to throw all the money at him uh, as they can. And as a matter of fact, we're not even going to know about some of it because we now know that he's been coordinating with these outside groups that are supposedly independent and keep their donors private. The only reason we know that a mining company gave him $700,000 uh, to be elected after he allowed them to write their own regulations is that it came out in a John Doe investigation and some released emails and things like that. So we don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars he got from both tribes and from all kinds of other people on both sides of this argument. That, that, that standard that you mentioned, that he mentioned early on, you know, he would only approve it if, if all the tribes agreed. 
Well, he knew the answer to that one. The Potawatomi weren't going to agree. The Ho-Chunk weren't going to agree because they run their own casinos. Uh, and there was another standard. He said he would also only approve it if it did not increase gambling in Wisconsin. Let me think, if the Hard Rock Cafe, you know, Hard Rock r Hotels build a casino in, in you know, Racine, Kenosha, uh, and it's an $800,000 casino? Do 800 million. 800, I'm sorry, yeah, $800 million casino? Do you, you think it might increase gambling in, in Wisconsin? I, you know, everything he said turned out not to be true. He delayed it as long as he possibly could. And, and didn't make it till after the election. It was brazen. It was just to grab hundreds of millions of dollars. And he, it was never going to be approved uh, under any of the standards that he ever laid out. How, how much influence uh, do you think was exerted on, on his decision-making process by all these influential conservatives in Iowa who said, do not expand gaming in Wisconsin? I don't know what that factor was. Um, Unless, of course, there were some heavy hitters financially who said, we will bankroll uh, a substantial portion of your campaign if you lay off of this. But I think the local folk at home were the ones that ultimately he was listening to to try to get it done, and I, I, I sincerely believe that. I, I, I also remember those statements that Joel had referred to uh, that the governor had made around the conditions under which um, gaming would be approved by him. And uh, there was a part of me, even at that time, that said, well, if it keeps the Potawatomi money at bay, um, because certainly they will jump into the campaign and they will go the traditional route of funding uh, the Democratic Party standard bear, um, then you're, you're, you're going to end up with a real fist fight in this race, because the Menominees are going to then decide to put their money behind a candidate that they think is going to win. Well, some of that got neutralized in that race. Ultimately, though, there were strong members in his own party, including Speaker Voss, that were saying, we want to get this deal done down here, and we want to get it done in order to improve the economic uh, uh, status of, of our community. They'd already been able to bring in some other projects like Amazon. And so there was real growth opportunity down in Kenosha, and I think the governor felt that pressure to do that. So he had to have a more credible reason than some of the things that uh, you referred to, Joel, in order to back off on it, because that would hurt him more as the party's leader than yielding to... Um, uh, some outside forces that might be willing to contribute. You know, it wasn't it wasn't just Republican leaders that were lobbying him. Uh, Demo oh, I know it was bipartisan. Democratic leaders were lo right. lobbying him. Peter Barker and, and Bob Wirtz, you know, Democratic legislators, rep legislators that that represent that area. Uh, and as a matter of fact, and you know this is true too, mm -hmm. uh, the tribes don't just contribute to one party. They, they contribute. They spread it around. They contribute to whoever they think is going to win. And everybody in this state thought. You know, Walker was going to be reelected, including the tribes. Did and, you believe that? Uh, no, I actually thought <laughs> I actually thought that there was a chance that he wouldn't be. But I always look on the bright side. Oh, okay. All right, we move on. Next topic. Governor Walker also said this week that he would, in fact, keep a campaign promise and will be offering a proposal soon to take away food stamps and unemployment benefits, public health care benefits from people who failed drug tests. Is this a sincere effort? or a public relations effort from somebody who might be running for president? <laughs> it's a phony public relations effort. It's against the law, what he proposed. Uh, federal law covering food stamps, covering unemployment, uh, forbids states from doing what he claims he's going to do. And he knows it. I mean, he, he's not an idiot. He, I, there are lots of things I disagree with him about, but he's not an idiot. But here's the, here's the, here, you know what? I can look in this proposal he just made, and I can see some good things. If he were really sincere about it, I could see some good things. You know what, what else is, like, hidden in there, almost accidentally? Uh, drug treatment on demand for poor people. We have drug treatment on demand for rich people that, you know, they pull out their insurance cards and they, you know, their kids or their wife or their or the husband in the family, you know, they can go out and get drug treatment anytime they want. And only for the wealthy and the well-to-do is, is drug treatment and drug problems considered a public health problem. That's what it is. P addiction is not a criminal 
offense, addiction is a health problem. And for the for people of means, it's treated that way. For poor people, it's treated as a criminal matter, and that is sending an enormous number of African Americans, Latinos, and other poor people to prison. And and that is tragic. And here's the deal. He says, look, if you test uh, positive for drugs, I'm going to provide you drug treatment. Well, he hasn't come up with any money for that, and, and you know, knowing that he's a conservative who doesn't want to spend money for any social program, that he's not going to come up for money with it. But here's the other proof that, he's, that that's just a phony promise. Because if you were going to provide drug pe treatment for people who tested positive for drugs, would you kill their health insurance? <laughs> would you take health insurance away from them? That's one of the things he wants to do. You know, you can't be on Badger Care uh, if you need drug treatment. Uh, well, how are you going to get this free drug treatment from the Walker administration uh, if you don't have health insurance? First of all, that's going to cost him even more. That makes it even less likely that he'll, he'll come up with a cent for it. Uh, the other thing is, you know, when you're having drug treatment, you know you have to eat. But, you know, drug treatment doesn't feed you, and food stamps are provided for people who are hungry and who need food and don't have enough money to, to buy food. And, you know, so you, you're going to take away their food stamps. You're going to take away health insurance for them that could fund some drug treatment. Uh, and, and then, you know, the unemployment thing is just ridiculous. But there are, there, there are a lot of people, in all honesty, that are saying, OK, why in the world would we give unemployment benefits to somebody who's using drugs, who will go to apply for a job, take the drug test, fail the drug test, why keep giving them unemployment benefits? Why not kick them in the direction of getting a job? That's, that's part of what uh, uh, the governor is hearing. That's part of what uh, legislators in rural communities are concerned about as well. Here's the thing, and I, what softens it for me is the reality that, one, if you, if you test positive for drugs under the governor's plan, you would then uh, have access to drug treatment. The <laughs> other is job training. And, and frankly, we won't know until the governor gives his budget address how he plans to support any of that initiative, including the piece uh, that, that drops the, um, uh, the years of eligibility from five to four for those who are on public assistance. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that there are private sector employers and a good number of them that um, uh, feel that when they, they administer these drug tests at the time of uh, potential employment, uh, that there are far too many that are screening out. And they're not getting any access to anything in the course of it. They're not getting the, the jobs uh, training benefits. They're not getting any kind of support in order to address the problem that they have. It's just not happening. Um, so, I, I, I think, one, it is going to end up in the courts. There are about four states that currently have something similar uh, that's either in place or, and all of them are being challenged, the ones that have implemented it. And they're, many of them have been thrown out. They're, they're, they're in courts, or the ones that have been thrown out, they certainly have gone back and tried to address what the courts have said you can't do. So, uh, ultimately, it's going to end up with a lot of litigation, and it'll be more food for thought than actual implementation of a, uh, of a program. We, we, do hear, we do hear a lot of business owners the last few years saying things like, you know, I have jobs, but I can't find enough people to fill those jobs. Either they don't have the skills or they can't pass the drug test. You know what? Uh, employers all over this state, uh, and I negotiated with one of them when I was in the union at the, at the Journal... Um, they have been sold a bill of goods. They have been told they should spend money drug testing every single person who applies for a job. The truth of the matter is there are a whole lot of people in this community and every community who are working for them now who use drugs. Uh, and, and the truth of the matter is they're doing very good work. And some of them are some of their best executives and some of their best employees. Uh, here... What, Scott Walker is supposed to be a small government conservative, and he is opposed to government overreach, and he's opposed to government reaching into the private lives of people all over this country. Well, he's mostly opposed to them trying to regulate business. But if you're against government intrusion, why in the world would you support government testing for drugs everybody in the community? 
Uh, why would you do that? You would say, well, well, but, but it's against the law. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, what Scott Walker's proposed here is also against the law. I guess it just depends on which law you break. But there are plenty of people living normal lives in this society who use drugs in their lives. I'm telling you, I, I know that it can become a problem, and when it becomes a problem, you should be able to get treatment. If Scott Walker were sincere about giving treatment and not just punishing people, uh, this proposal would make a little bit of sense, but it's but it's ridiculous to tell people you can't eat if you use drugs, you can't, uh, you know, get unemployment if you're out of a job if you use drugs. Uh, you can't get health insurance if you use drugs. If you use drugs, you might well need some health insurance. Bottom and, line and, is and don't use drugs. drugs. Yeah, but people do it, and I'm not saying... Then there ought to be a consequence for that. Uh, <laughs> no, you should not have a consequence for something that everybody is doing, but only poor people get punished for it. All right, let's move on. Now let's talk about the streetcar controversy here in Milwaukee. Aldermen vote to hold off on final approval until next month now to give opponents time to gather signatures which would give voters, via a binding referendum, the final say on whether or not the downtown streetcar gets billed. All right, look into the crystal ball. I, I know everything in this community takes forever and ever and ever to get done, but what do you think is going to happen? Are, are they going to get the signatures? Is it, is the, is it going to be stopped? What do you think is going to happen? I think they'll get the signatures. Um, my guess is they're about 60% of the way there now. Uh, they'll turn up the steam to uh, go out and maybe do a door-to-door -door canvassing, uh, but they'll certainly ratchet up the effort to get the signatures. Um, I, for the life of me, have yet to hear why this has such a high priority, especially among the African-American uh, elected officials, um, when it doesn't address to any great extent, the jobs issue. It doesn't address to any great extent how community efforts to improve neighborhoods are going to benefit from this. It doesn't address how they're going to pay for this in the long haul, even though one uh, uh, elected official has said, well, there's about three years of subsidy from the federal government. The operating cost is, is uh, going to be borne by somebody. And if they try to throw it onto the, the county transit system, then once they start to run a deficit, who picks that up? Is that going to be the obligation of the county to do it? And will they then have to cut transit service to those who regularly ride all those other buses that are uh, moving people to and from work? Um, it, it just... It rankles me that none of those questions have been adequately answered by any of the proponents of this, and yet they continue to feel smug, almost, that this is something that is going to have huge benefit. MPS stands to lose $40 million, uh, and who knows how much MATC will lose. And all they can say is that the study that was done by their own legislative fiscal bureau, it's wrong. They've even called the author of the report a liar. It's not wrong. It's what is actually true. The other uh, <laughs> story that they come back with as well, there, we've got 81 other TIF districts that have been uh, created as a result of uh, development uh, throughout, the, throughout the community. And not once has MPS or, MPA or MATC have they ever complained about those TIFs being created. The difference between the other TIFs and this TIF is that they have yet to explain how a streetcar will magically improve property values or uh, opportunities for investment in downtown, other than to say, people will come. And, 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 and when you look at buildings like Northwestern Mutual, most recently, or even the, the, the Couture, those are genuine real estate development projects that will have real real estate and, and property value increases attached to them, where I could see somewhere down the line, whatever money was invested will be recovered. I don't see it happening with, with this thing, and that's why I think it's going to die, because they haven't been able to articulate it. If they can't explain it to me, I doubt that they can explain it to a whole lot of others that will make them not want to sign a petition to... Um, uh, to stop this project. I, I find it interesting that this has become such a big issue, because I don't think most people really care whether or not there's a downtown streetcar. Do you? Well, uh, the website Urban Milwaukee did a survey, mm -hmm. um, which... <laughs> 
You know that the people in Alderman Donovan's district support it? Do you know that the people in Alderman Davis's district support it? The two aldermen who are the primary opponents to it? Um, I, 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 you know, we talked a lot about the streetcar in this program, and, and I said for a long time I'm not that enthusiastic about it either, but I see it the, as the start of another real tra mass transit system in this community, which is pathetic as far as mass transit. Uh, they've started in the, in the most heavily traveled corridors, but ultimately if it could go up through the north side, if it could go down to the airport, uh, this could be the start of a really important mass transit system in, in, in this community. But here, here's the weird thing, the people opposing it, I don't like those people. The Koch brothers, what do the Koch brothers, I know they, they support, you know, Scott Walker for governor because he's a conservative and, 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 you know, he could possibly funnel a lot of money to their businesses. But, uh, you know, what do they care about what goes on in this community? The Koch brothers, of all the things, they, all, they've they got political operations going all over this country. Uh, why do they care about, you know, whether the streetcar happens or not? Uh, this, uh, the, I w thought it was defunct, the uh, Citizens for Responsible Government, you know, a decade or more or so ago, they, they were involved in some recalls at the county over the pension funds, and, and I think they've always been trying to recapture that glory. And, and, and the right-wing radio. I mean, these are the forces in our community that are fighting it. And those aren't very, you know, respectable people. And we got the mayor and the majority of the common council. The only reason it was delayed for a few weeks was that the opponents were going to use a procedural thing to make them delay it. So they said, okay, we'll let you have a few more weeks. But, you know, these petitions aren't going anywhere. They really aren't. I would, I would, I beg to differ. I don't think that they are going to get that many signatures in, in this short a time. Uh, you know, I, I see them in, in, you know, coffee shops that, you know, half a dozen people have signed. But uh, I just don't think that all adds up to 31,000. And, and, ha and it has support from the aldermen all over this community and from the citizens no, all over if this you, community. If you look at the dividing line, it has north side aldermen and other elected officials supporting it. And on the south side, it hardly has anyone supporting it. I can't think of one who does that represents the south uh, side Witkowski. of the city. That's one. That, that, that would be one, and who knows? He might be one. And, and now that, that, you know, there, there's a proposed extension to the airport, it's getting more south side support. At, at what cost, though? Because the, uh, the see, money that's available right now isn't a part of but all this, of these extensions this, 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 that they keep the talking start. about. Well, it's, it's a start, start, but then that's more money. It's more than 124. And, and also, we've got all this money from the federal government that we could... $64 million. That we could use to start this system. $64 million, dollars, and the rest but of the money... You want it has to, throw, to come from want, tax revenue. No, it doesn't. It, yes, it, it does. That's where office. it's coming from. The TIF, it comes from some... Uh, that's some, tax revenue. Uh, yeah. All right, we'll move on. <laughs> from, from improved... From a possible Milwaukee streetcar to the reality of Capitol Hill. That's where President Obama delivered his latest State of the Union address earlier this week. Rick Horowitz tuned in to watch. Of course, he found the atmosphere very different from what he expected. Rick. Just in case you're wondering, uh, this is how someone looks when he's getting ready to deliver a primetime smackdown on national TV when he knows what's coming and they have no idea. Did some Republicans start to applaud when Barack Obama said he had no more campaigns left to run? Fine. Time for a little reality therapy. I know he's about to say, because I won both of them. Ouch. It's just like my father used to say, you never really know a person until you've walked a mile in her bread bags. <laughs> and it's true. You and I, we've never been president. We can only imagine what it feels like. But we can make a few educated guesses, and right now, I'm guessing it feels pretty good. Not to her, uh, to him. True, he had to do some happy talking in that speech, highly unrealistically optimistic about the way things are going in the rest of the world. Russia is still mucking around in Ukraine despite the sanctions. ISIS is still on the move. Negotiations with Iran still up in the air. Talks with Cuba too early to tell. Although on the positive side, the uh, government of Yemen was kind enough to wait until after the speech to collapse. But on the domestic front, the numbers are good, stronger than they've been in years, in fact. On the economy, on gas prices, on bringing down the deficit, on bringing up by millions the number of people with health insurance. Another number that's down, the number of Democrats in Congress listening to Obama's speech. But even that seemed like oddly good news to him. Free at last. He didn't have to keep out of sight anymore, keep his policies undefended, his successes unmentioned, to try to drag some nervous red state Democrats across the finish line in November. 
He kept quiet. He stayed out of their states. They lost anyway. And now he's liberated. He can push the programs he wants to push, the programs he thinks are best for the country. He can visit Idaho for Pete's sake. He can go to Kansas. He can ignore the congressional election results of 2014 the same way the Republicans have always ignored the presidential election results of 2008 and 2012. You know, the campaigns he won both of. He can enjoy himself. Six years in, guess what? He's still got game. This duck ain't lame. Well, thanks, Rick, and thank you so very much for joining us. Stay warm. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.